Book two, chapters fifteen and sixteen of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume One, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book two, chapters fifteen and sixteen. Chapter fifteen. How the Hebrews, under the conduct of Moses, left Egypt. So the Hebrews went out of Egypt, while the Egyptians wept, and repented that they had treated them so hardly. Now they took their journey by Letopolis, a place at that time deserted, but where Babylon was built afterwards, when Cambyses laid Egypt waste. But as they went away hastily, on the third day they came to a place called Belzephon, on the Red Sea and when they had no food out of the land, because it was a desert, they eat of loaves kneaded of flour, only warmed by a gentle heat, and this food they made use of for thirty days, for what they brought with them out of Egypt would not suffice them any longer time, and this only while they dispensed it to each person, to use so much only as would serve for necessity, but not for satiety. Whence it is that, in memory of the want we were then in, we keep a feast for eight days, which is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now the entire multitude of those that went out, including the women and children, was not easy to be numbered, but those that were of an age fit for war were six hundred thousand. They left Egypt in the month Xanthicus, on the fifteenth day of the lunar month, four hundred and thirty years after our forefather Abraham came into Canaan, but two hundred and fifteen years only after Jacob removed into Egypt. It was the eightieth year of the age of Moses, and of that of Aaron three more. They also carried out the bones of Joseph with them, as he had charged his sons to do. But the Egyptians soon repented that the Hebrews were gone, and the king also was mightily concerned that this had been procured by the magic arts of Moses, so they resolved to go after them. Accordingly they took their weapons and other warlike furniture, and pursued after them, in order to bring them back, if once they overtook them, because they would now have no pretense to pray to God against them, since they had already been permitted to go out. And they thought they should easily overcome them, as they had no armor, and would be weary with their journey. So they made haste in their pursuit, and asked of every one they met which way they were gone and indeed that land was difficult to be travelled over, not only by armies but by single persons. Now Moses led the Hebrews this way, that in case the Egyptians should repent and be desirous to pursue after them, they might undergo the punishment of their wickedness and of the breach of those promises they had made to them. As also he led them this way on account of the Philistines, who had quarrelled with them and hated them of old, that by all means they might not know of their departure, for their country is near to that of Egypt. And thence it was that Moses led them not along the road that tended to the land of the Philistines, but he was desirous that they should go through the desert, that so after a long journey, and after many afflictions, they might enter upon the land of Canaan. Another reason of this was, that God commanded him to bring the people to Mount Sinai, that there they might offer him sacrifices. Now when the Egyptians had overtaken the Hebrews, they prepared to fight them, and by their multitude they drove them into a narrow place, for the number that pursued after them was six hundred chariots, with fifty thousand horsemen, and two hundred thousand footmen, all armed. They also seized upon the passages by which they imagined the Hebrews might fly, shutting them up between inaccessible precipices and the sea for there was on each side a ridge of mountains that terminated at the sea, which were impassable by reason of their roughness, and obstructed their flight. Wherefore they were pressed upon the Hebrews with their army, where the ridges of the mountains were closed with the sea, which army they placed at the chops of the mountains, so that they might deprive them of any passage into the plain. When the Hebrews, therefore, were neither able to bear up, being thus, as it were, besieged, because they wanted provisions, nor saw any possible way of escaping, and if they should have thought of fighting, they had no weapons. They expected a universal destruction, unless they delivered themselves up to the Egyptians. 
So they laid the blame on Moses, and forgot all the signs that had been wrought by God for the recovery of their freedom, and this so far that their incredulity prompted them to throw stones at the prophet, while he encouraged them and promised them their deliverance and they resolved that they would deliver themselves up to the Egyptians. So there was sorrow and lamentation among the women and children, who had nothing but destruction before their eyes, while they were encompassed with mountains, the sea, and their enemies, and discerned no way of flying from them. But Moses, though the multitude looked fiercely at him, did not, however, give over the care of them, but despised all dangers out of his trust in God, who, as he had afforded them the several steps already taken for the recovery of their liberty, which he had foretold them, would not now suffer them to be subdued by their enemies, to be either made slaves or be slain by them. And, standing in the midst of them, he said, It is not just of us to distrust even men, when they have hitherto well managed our affairs, as if they would not be the same hereafter but it is no better than madness at this time to despair of the providence of God, by whose power all those things have been performed he promised, when you expected no such things. I mean all that I have been concerned in for deliverance and escape from slavery. Nay, when we were in the utmost distress, as you see we ought rather to hope that God will succor us, by whose operation it is that we are now this narrow place, that he may out of such difficulties as are otherwise insurmountable, and out of which neither you nor your enemies expect you can be delivered, and may at once demonstrate his own power and his providence over us. Nor does God use to give his help in small difficulties to those whom he favors, but in such cases where no one can see how any hope in man can better their condition. Depend, therefore, upon such a protector as is able to make small things great, and to show that this mighty force against you is nothing but weakness, and be not affrighted at the Egyptian army, nor do you despair of being preserved, because the sea before and the mountains behind afford you no opportunity for flying, for even these mountains, if God so please, may be made plain ground for you, and the sea become dry land. Chapter 16 How the Sea Was Divided Asunder for the Hebrews, when they were pursued by the Egyptians, and so gave them an opportunity of escaping from them. When Moses had said this, he led them to the sea, while the Egyptians looked on, for they were within sight. Now these were so distressed by the toil of their pursuit, that they thought proper to put off fighting till the next day. But when Moses was come to the seashore, he took his rod and made supplication to God, and called upon him to be their helper and assistant and said, Thou art not ignorant, O Lord, that it is beyond human strength and human contrivance to avoid the difficulties we are now under. But it must be thy work altogether to procure deliverance to this army, which has left Egypt at thy appointment. We despair of any other assistance or contrivance, and have recourse only to that hope we have in thee. And if there be any method that can promise us an escape by thy providence, we look up to thee for it, and let it come quickly, and manifest thy power to us. And do thou raise up this people unto good courage and hope of deliverance, who are deeply sunk into a disconsolate state of mind. We are in a helpless place, but still it is a place that thou possessest. Still the sea is thine, the mountains also that enclose us are thine, so that these mountains will open themselves if thou commandest them, and the sea also, if thou commandest it, will become dry land. Nay, we might escape by a flight through the air, if thou shouldst determine we should have that way of salvation. When Moses had thus addressed himself to God, he smote the sea with his rod, which parted asunder at the stroke, and receiving those waters into itself, left the ground dry as a road and a place of flight for the Hebrews. Now when Moses saw this appearance of God, and that the sea went out of its own place, and left dry land, he went first of all into it, and bid the Hebrews to follow him along that divine road, and to rejoice at the danger their enemies that followed them were in, and gave thanks to God for this so surprising a deliverance which appeared from him. Now, while these Hebrews made no stay, but went on earnestly, as led by God's presence with them, the Egyptians supposed first that they were distracted, 
and were going rashly upon manifest destruction. But when they saw that they were going a great way without any harm, and that no obstacle or difficulty fell in their journey, they made haste to pursue them, hoping that the sea would be calm for them also. They put their horse foremost, and went down themselves into the sea. Now the Hebrews, while these were putting on their armor, and therein spending their time, were beforehand with them, and escaped them, and got first over to the land on the other side without any hurt. Whence the others were encouraged, and more courageously pursued them, as hoping no harm would come to them neither. But the Egyptians were not aware that they went into a road made for the Hebrews, and not for others, that this road was made for the deliverance of those in danger, but not for those that were earnest to make use of it for the others' destruction. As soon, therefore, as ever the whole Egyptian army was within it, the sea flowed to its own place, and came down with a torrent raised by storms of wind, and encompassed the Egyptians. Showers of rain also came down from the sky, and dreadful thunders and lightning with flashes of fire. Thunderbolts also were darted upon them. Nor was there anything which used to be sent by God upon men as indications of his wrath, which did not happen at this time, for a dark and dismal night oppressed them. And thus did all these men perish, so that there was not one man left to be a messenger of this calamity to the rest of the Egyptians. But the Hebrews were not able to contain themselves for joy at their wonderful deliverance and destruction of their enemies, now indeed supposing themselves firmly delivered, when those that would have forced them into slavery were destroyed, and when they found they had God so evidently for their protector. And now these Hebrews, having escaped the danger they were in after this manner, and besides that, seeing their enemies punished in such a way as is never recorded of any other men whomsoever, were all the night employed in singing of hymns and in mirth. Moses also composed a song unto God, containing his praises, and a thanksgiving for his kindness, in hexameter verse. As for myself, I have delivered every part of this history as I found it in the sacred books, nor let any one wonder at the strangeness of the narration, if a way were discovered to those men of old time, who were free from the wickedness of the modern ages, whether it happened by the will of God, or whether it happened of its own accord. While, for the sake of those that accompanied Alexander, king of Macedonia, who yet lived, comparatively but a little while ago, the Pamphylian sea retired and afforded them a passage through itself, had no other way to go. I mean, when it was the will of God to destroy the monarchy of the Persians, and this is confessed to be true by all who have written about the actions of Alexander. But as to these events, let every one determine as he pleases. On the next day Moses gathered together the weapons of the Egyptians, which were brought to the camp of the Hebrews by the current of the sea, and the force of the winds resisting it. And he conjectured that this also happened by divine providence, so that they might not be destitute of weapons. So when he had ordered the Hebrews to arm themselves with them, he led them to Mount Sinai, in order to offer sacrifice to God, and to render oblations for the salvation of the multitude, as he was charged to do beforehand. End of Book 2, Chapters 15 and 16 End of Book 2